Well, good morning, Journey. How are we doing this morning? Man, time changed nothing. Y'all are here and I love it. Awesome, it's good to be with you. My name is Dustin Agard and uh, I get to serve as one of the pastors here. Wanna give a shout out and welcome everybody joining us online as well as Lake County. I was able to uh, hang out in Lake County last week and Lake County, let me just tell you, you are looking good. I love what God is doing in Lake County and uh, you guys be kind to Pastor Roddy today, you're in for a treat. And, uh, and here's the cool thing, uh, God is moving in Lake County and God is moving online and God is moving and Apopka, and we get so excited to see what God is doing and answering all these prayers. If you weren't with us last week, we started a brand new series called Cross Examine, and Pastor John did a great job kicking that off, and if you missed that for whatever reason, I wanna encourage you, go online, uh, go ahead and watch that. It's okay if you hear this and then go back and watch that, uh, but that was a great kickoff, and we're gonna kick off week two of really what happened on the cross. And some of you are like, well, I, I think I have an idea. We're gonna dig a little bit deeper. But before we go in, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need a little bit of audience participation. Is that okay this early in the morning? Okay, yeah, you, 9.30 is down for whatever. That's what I love about y'all. Y'all are always ready. So, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna put up a logo, and if you recognize it, you're gonna, you're gonna say it. But, but here's the deal. Um, it's okay if you say it out loud, okay? I know some of you are like, well, can we talk in church? Half of y'all talk in church anyways, okay? So just, you know, I'm just saying, let's just go ahead and do it. So here's the, here's the first one right here. Chick-fil-A, Chick yes. Now y'all are like, man, why, why is Pastor Desmond showing us Chick-fil-A on a day we can't have Chick-fil-A? That's evil. <laughs> That's messed up. All right, that, that was easy. We just started easy. How about this one? Magic. Some of y'all don't even know, and we have an NBA team in Orlando called the Orlando Magic. And, and here's the deal. I talk about the Miami Dolphins a lot, and I do it a little bit because it's just fun. I'm actually a huge Orlando Magic fan, and I love the NBA. It's just none of y'all do, and so I don't talk about it that much. Um, all right, and how about this one? Beats. Some of y'all weren't quite sure. So Beats, and y'all are like, Beats like, like the food you eat? No, nah. this is uh, headphones. You could actually almost see the headphone in the logo. It's the largest uh, headphone distributor in the US. I don't know where it is in the world, but it's pretty big. So uh, now owned by Apple. So some of y'all are starting to fade. You weren't sure of that. All right, let's, let's see the next one. Avengers, they got like over 20 uh, blockbuster movies in the Avengers series, yes, y'all are in. All right, how about this one? Hurley, yes. I don't know what it is, but I think this side, if there's a competition, is winning. I'm just saying. That's where the... <laughs> now y'all are starting, yeah, TikTok. Some of y'all are like, yeah, that's cool. What's a TikTok? I ain't got time to go there. Under Armour. Under Armour. Under Armour. Now listen, we're gonna pause right there. And let's just say you've got none of them right, okay? You're down seven nothing. This last one counts as a thousand points. You can win the whole thing right here. What's this one? Atari, more y'all got that than I thought. Y'all get it, man, round of applause. Well done. That was good. Now here's the deal. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars spent on a logo because they communicate so much and they're so powerful. They help the brand, they communicate to the customers, to the clients, a logo matters. And what they do is it's not just one person. A lot of times they'll bring in a collaborative effort and they'll, they'll do surveys, they'll do all kinds of studies and research. And so if it were me and I were to come up with a, a team of people and guys say, all right, let's come up with a logo that would, that would be a, kind of a symbol for a movement for all of mankind, both men and women to kind of come together to, something that would be an exciting, enticing. The last logo I think I would come up with would be this. The very last logo I would come up with would be a cross. I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying I'm wrong. I would not think that a cross would be the logo that would bring people together, because here's the thing, no matter where I go on the planet, the cross is recognized. No matter when over the past 2,000 years, the cross has power. There's something about the cross and there's something about the man named Jesus. C.S. Lewis pointed out something I thought was interesting. He said, the crucifixion didn't become common 
and art until all who had seen a real one had died off. His idea is if people, if us, if we actually saw one, our view of it would change, probably in a deeper appreciation, but I thought that was interesting. So we're gonna talk about what really happened on the cross, and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna walk us through five quick points, and each point's gonna have a takeaway. So if you're a note taker, you're gonna love this. If you don't take notes, uh, you might fall asleep. I don't know. Here we go. The first one is this. At the cross, our guilt is declared pardoned. So the first thing that we see is at the cross, our guilt is declared pardoned. Pardon's not a word we use every day. Okay, so I'm gonna unpack this a little bit, but here we go. Pilate was guilty of great injustice. The Pharisees were guilty of envy. The soldiers were guilty of cruelty. The crowds were guilty of mockery. Even the disciples were guilty of cowardice, denial, and betrayal. Everybody was guilty except Jesus, the one that was crucified. I don't know if, uh, I don't know your driving history. Men, I'm talking to you. But have you ever been driving and maybe you're just jamming to a good song or you're in a hurry and, uh, and you're thinking, man, life is good and then all of a sudden this happens. Now, some of y'all are crazy because I've talked to you and you're like, how far back is he? Can I beat him? <laughs> That's not the response. Some of y'all right now just have anxiety hearing that. Like, I have anxiety. And if you're a police officer, we love you. We love you. Remember our faces. Give us a warning. I have a, a pastor that I know. He was, he was late to church. Some of y'all think y'all are the only ones late to church. This is a pastor, he was late to church. He's teaching that day. So now he's like, man, he's, he's stressed. He, he's not seeing everything. He's not aware of what's going on. And, and all of a sudden he's driving to church and then all of a sudden this happens. And when you're a pastor, you just can't run, you know? And so he's got to pull over and he's there. he rolls his window down. He's all ready. He's got his credentials ready. And, and the police officer comes up to the window and he immediately blurts out, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. And the police officer just kind of stares at him. And he said, well, pastor, that's a lot. It's a lot to take in. He said, I'm just curious. You're, you're guilty, guilty, guilty of what? What is it you need to confess, pastor? <laughs> and so now the police officer's having a little fun with the pastor. And the pastor doesn't know what he did wrong. He has no idea. And so he kind of turns it a little spiritual. And he said, well... I think we're all guilty. I think you're guilty. I think I'm guilty. I think we're all guilty, officer, don't you? It didn't work that day with the police officer, but the point is we are all guilty. All of us are guilty, whether we know it or not, except the difference with my pastor friend is he just immediately screamed it, but he wasn't sure what. I'm not gonna go political, so stay with me. The very last day of Donald Trump's presidency, he had 74 presidential pardons. 74, you may not be familiar with this. Uh, one of the things that the, the president of the United States has is he has the power to pardon somebody of a federal crime. Now, this is a crime that they have been convicted guilty of, but if you're pardoned, it does not mean that you're innocent. It means you don't have to pay the price for your sin. It's a presidential pardon. And I found it fascinating in the news uh, around this time, there were two different people that stood out. And I'm gonna tell you about them, but I am not encouraging them, their lifestyle, whatever. I'm just sharing some news, okay? The first one is a guy named Joe Exotic. <laughs> I don't know, okay? Well, we're just gonna blame COVID on him. When this series came out, COVID came out. So Joe Exotic uh, is facing 22 years in prison for a murder for hire plot to kill his rival. The entire time he pleaded innocent, even though he was convicted guilty, he pleaded innocent and he did a massive PR plan to President Donald Trump. And he was so convicted or so convinced that he was gonna be pardoned that he literally, some of you saw this, he had a stretched limousine waiting outside the prison. Okay, you with me? 
That was a disappointing day for Joe, okay? He did not get pardoned. We're gonna compare Joe to a guy uh, we call Lil Wayne, okay? <laughs> it's Lil, L-I-L, not, it's Lil. It's just fun to say, Lil Wayne. <laughs> Lil Wayne uh, was arrested and guilty for carrying a firearm on a private jet from California to Florida, okay? You can't do that, okay? He pleaded guilty, guilty, he, I'm guilty, he apologized, he confessed, he didn't try to hide it, and here's what's interesting. Donald Trump didn't let Joe Exotic off, but he did let Little Wayne off. He gave Little Wayne a presidential pardon. And I just wonder in my spiritual mindset, this is how I looked at it. You and I cannot, we cannot receive a pardon of God when we still think we're innocent. What is he gonna pardon from? If we don't have any sin, then we can't be forgiven for it. But yet here, little Wayne saying, no, no, I'm guilty, 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 and he gets pardoned. And the more that you and I throw our hands up to God and say, God, I'm guilty, 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 God says, I got a pardon that's better than a presidential pardon. It's not that you're innocent, it's that I'm gonna take the price. And I let you off the hook. But the moment we put our hands in our pocket and say we're innocent, 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 Jesus says, then you don't need a savior. But it's in our confession, it's in our need for a savior that we find redemption on the cross. And so the takeaway for this first point is confess your guilt and accept his pardon. It's when we confess our guilt that we can receive his pardon. And I'm not staring at anybody in the room that's not a messed up sinner like me. It's just some of us don't wanna admit it. And I'm telling you, the moment that you can admit your sin, you can be pardoned instantly. And my prayer is that you stop carrying the weight of the sin that God never intended for you to carry because it died 2,000 years ago on a cross. Second point is this, on the cross, Jesus' blood gives us life. On the cross, Jesus' blood gives us life. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, he shares, be shepherds of the church of God, which he, meaning Jesus, bought with his own blood. The writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You see, on the cross, what we see is that Jesus' sacrifice gives us life. In World War II, there was a man named Max. And by the way, we have so many incredible men and women, heroes, World War II, all of our wars that have allowed us to do what we're doing today. And I'm so grateful. One of those heroes, yes, we can clap for them. Thank you for what you do. So grateful. One of those heroes is a guy named Max, and this was in World War II. And Max was a medic. One of his jobs, his main job, was to run onto the battlefield and, and try to rescue and save people before they died, whether, whatever the, the wound was. But his charge was go and rescue not just US, but the allies, but also the enemy, the people fighting for Nazi Germany. And a lot of times what he was doing is he was giving blood transfusions. And where they were getting the blood a lot of times was from Jewish people. And so what he would do is he would go around saving people and then when he got some of the people that were fighting for Nazi Germany, he would say, hey, I'm Max, I'm here to save you. Can I, re can I help rescue? They would say yes. Say, okay, you need a blood transfusion, is that okay? And they would say yes. And they would say, the only blood that I have that can save your life is the blood from a Jewish person, is that okay? And some of them sadly would say no, that they would choose death than that blood. And so Max said that he would, he would say, okay, no, and then he would just wait till they pass out and then he would save them anyways. And listen, you and I, it's the same thing. The blood of a Jewish man can save your life. And his name is Jesus. The difference between Max and Jesus is Max not in a harsh way, I'm not belittling Max. He forced it upon them even after they passed out. Jesus will not force his blood on you. Jesus will give you the option and he will let you live with whatever option you choose. You could either choose to reject the blood that was shed on the cross or you can receive the blood and what we learn from the cross is that it's his blood that gives us life. That's what we learn. The second takeaway for that would be through Jesus' blood you can have new life. Through Jesus' blood, you can have new life. Third thing that we learn, through the cross, the grave is overthrown. Through the cross, the grave is overthrown. 
This is what Matthew tells us. It says, at the moment, this is, this is right after uh, the, 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 the crucifixion, at the moment of the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died had been raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. You see, Jesus isn't the only person to experience the resurrection. He's the first of many. I don't know if we understand this. He is the first of many. There's already been a start to the resurrection. We're just following our leader. You see, through the cross, the grave has been overthrown. This is what 1 Corinthians, this is what Paul says. He says, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, what this means is because the grave has been overthrown, we don't grieve as those with no hope. That's actually what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know that what, what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. As Christians, we don't grieve like people who have no hope. This past week, we experienced the one-year mark of the shutdown. And in the United States, we've seen over a half, or 500,000, almost half a million people have passed either from COVID or COVID-related symptoms. Some of these people are your coworkers, your loved ones, people that you might know. It maybe it had nothing to do with COVID, but this past year, you just happened to lose someone. Just yesterday, I said goodbye to a friend. We were at his funeral, and let me tell you, it was a awesome funeral. Matter of fact, we, nobody used the word funeral. It was a celebration of life. And it was rocking and we celebrated and I'm looking around and how can we do that? Because we don't grieve like people with no hope. You see, we understood where our friend was. We have grief. I'm not saying we don't grieve. We have grief. I miss my friend. We miss our loved ones. Don't, don't misunderstand me. It's just we don't grieve as if those who have no hope. We have hope. Jesus has created hope through the cross. And here's the takeaway. Because of the cross, we have hope. Number four, at the cross, we see the measure of God's love for us. The cross shows us the measure of God's love. You see, they could stop Jesus' lungs from breathing, but they couldn't stop his heart from loving. That's what I love about my Jesus. We're talking about this idea of logos, and there's a church called Hillsong Church. They came up with it, just a, a brilliant, I think, simple logo, and they, they use it a lot during Easter and kind of all year long, and it's this right here. It's that the cross equals love. And if you don't remember anything else today, this is what I want you to remember, that the cross equals love. That God's crazy about you, that the cross demonstrates how much he really loves and values you. This is what John 10, 18 says. It says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want and also when to take it back up for this is what the father commanded us. You see, it's important for us to know that nobody took Jesus' life, he gave it. God gave him his son away and then Jesus voluntarily gave his life up. And the cross was so painful that there was actually a word invented to describe it. It's excruciating. It means from the cross. I'm gonna bring up uh, a couple people to kind of help illustrate this. Uh, Riley and Jacob, would y'all come up and, and they're gonna give you a big round of applause. Y'all come right here. I apologize, they're teenagers and it's the morning. <laughs> Going a little slow. Okay, here we go. Here you go, you're over here, you're over here. This is my son, Riley. And uh, yeah, this is Jacob. And I've known, I've known Jacob uh, for most of his life. And Riley and Jacob are, are good buddies and our families are good friends. And, uh, and they are, uh, just interesting when they get around each other. Y'all can have your own reality show. So, <laughs> Jacob, you know that I care about you, right? You know that I love you. I've known you most of your life. I love you. Riley, you're my son. I'm proud of you. You know that I love you, okay? And how much I love you is different than how much I love you, Jacob. Jacob, here's where it goes south for you, okay? <laughs> Jacob, 
if we were in a situation where in order to save your life, I had to sacrifice his, you need to make sure that you know Jesus, okay? <laughs> because you are about to meet him, okay? Because although I love you, I'm just telling you as a dad, I, I don't care. I'm not sacrificing my son for even somebody that I love. Like, like at all, I'm not, it's not even a conversation. I don't wanna hear your plan. I don't wanna, uh, there's nothing, there's no conversation. The love that I have for my son, my one and only son, is not gonna be sacrificed for someone else, period. However, if it were, if for whatever reason I did, Jacob would, if I sacrificed Riley, okay? And I know what you're thinking, who are you gonna play video games with? We'll deal with that later, okay? If I, if I sacrificed Riley to save your life, would you consider that a massive expression of how much I love you? Absolutely. The problem is, is when if I sacrifice my son for Jacob and Jacob walks around like I don't care about him, that's a problem that would break me. You're telling me I'm gonna sacrifice my son and you don't even think I care about you or love you? And that's what we do. Jesus has sacrificed his son and we're still like, God, do you love me? Are you kidding? Absolutely. Thank y'all. You give them a big round of applause, good job. <laughs> On the cross, Jesus showed you how much he loves you when he stretched out his arms and he said, I love you this much. If you don't hear anything else, you need to understand the cross equals love. And the takeaway for that is you know your love because the cross equals love. The fifth thing that we learn from the cross is the cross brings people to a decision. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. There was a pastor that put it brilliantly, and I want, I want to read kind of what, how he described this great exchange. This is what he said. He said, in his own life and teaching, Jesus was what might be called the great reversal. He says, blessed are those that the world thinks are unblessed. The least are the most. The poor shall be rich. The first will be last. You have to die in order to live. In weakness, you find strength. In becoming a servant, you become great. Now his cross becomes a kind of a great exchange where this great reversal happens and where it can happen for any human being. I come here and I exchange my guilt for his innocence my woundedness for his healing, my weakness for his strength, my brokenness for his wholeness, and my death for his life. The message of the cross says that something is wrong with this world and needs to be set right, and only God could do that, and he does it, strangely, above all, at a cross. You see, when Jesus died on the cross that day, he didn't die alone. It was the most significant death, but not the only one. When he died, there was someone on his right and on his left, two criminals. And they kind of played out not too different than Joe Exotic and Little Wayne. You see, one criminal actually mocked Jesus and mocked him and his claim to be God and wasn't wanting to deal with his guilt. And the other one was the opposite. He said, man, we are guilty, but this man is innocent. And then he said, this is what he said to Jesus. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The man that didn't claim he was guilty died that day. The man that said he was guilty came alive. You see, the cross forces us to make a decision. The cross forces you and me to make a decision. What will our posture be towards the cross, towards what happened on the cross, toward the measure of the love on the cross. Many of you made that decision. Last week, my youngest made that decision. Last week, my daughter Darby at the 1115 here at Apopka, she got baptized 
as, you could definitely clap for that, yes. And we have a, a gentleman named Michael. He's, he's following the same lead. Michael's about to get baptized, and, and maybe it's your moment. Last week was Darby's, the week before that, someone else. This morning, Michael, maybe it's you. There is no, I'll wait. There is no, let me think about it. That's a decision. I'll wait, I'll think about it. That's a decision. An indecision is a decision. What is your posture to the greatest love story ever told? And just like I brought Riley and Jacob up here uh, and I were to sacrifice my son for Jacob and Jacob were to say, well, I'm not really sure about you, Dustin. Are you kidding me? I sacrificed my son for you and you're just kind of like, eh? You see, Jesus' love for you is so great. He doesn't want you to miss it for another day. He doesn't want you to carry the weight of your sin another day. That was the point of the cross. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much that you voluntarily sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me knucklehead Dustin Agar, the one that would still let you down and disappoint you and be riddled with sin. You sent your son to die for me and my friends and all humanity. And Jesus, you had a choice in this. You voluntarily gave yourself up. You climbed onto the cross willingly because you were thinking of just one person that's in this room, that's watching online, that's in Lake County. And you're saying, I'll do all of that for that person because I'm crazy about them. That's what the cross was all about. It was about love. And God, would there not be one person that's listening to this message that would reject the greatest love story ever known? And God, I pray for that, that boy or girl, that man or woman that is carrying a weight that you tried to get rid of 2000 years ago. It's the weight of sin, it's the weight of shame, it's the weight of rejection. And God, you wanna exchange that in the great exchange and give them life and life to the fullest. And so God, would today be the day? And Lord, there's only one response that we have to the cross, and that is to throw our hands up and to surrender and to worship you with all that we have. And we're gonna do that with our voices, we're gonna do that with our minds, we're gonna do that with our feet and with our lives. For the rest of our life, Jesus, we love you. And we thank you. In your son's name we pray, amen.